Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship at Edison Lutheran. It's good to have you all here. Uh, now, if you, uh, for the more detailed among you, may have noticed that something is different today. <laughs> I don't know if you could figure out something's a little bit different. We're all turned around today. We feel a little turned around this morning for some reason. Um, that uh, has been the work of some of the members of our property committee. Um, and this is part of a way of uh, preparing for when uh, rain becomes something that we need to expect on Sunday mornings. Uh, we think this direction will be a little more protected for us on the stage. And, you know, it changes things up for, for all of you, although now we get the view of uh, the mountain and uh, when when we can see it. I can see about half of it right now. Uh, and uh, you don't get it quite as well. But, you know, uh, you have to share with your pastor sometimes. So those are sacrifices you all have to make. And that's just going to be all right. Uh, so welcome this morning. Uh, if you haven't been here before, uh, hopefully you received... On your way in, uh, one of these, uh, along with your bulletin, one or however many of these little communion uh, packets that you need. And so just to notice, there are two openings on the top. There's a clear plastic uh, piece that peels off, and then there's the foil piece that, that peels off. And so the clear plastic is for the bread, and the foil is for the, the grape juice. Um, and so there'll be a little more instruction on that when we come to the actual communion portion of the service. Our text today comes from Philippians. That's the text we're going to be focusing on. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. It's uh, maybe the most famous portion of uh, Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Paul's letter to the Philippian church. Um, and uh, so that's where we're going to be looking and uh, hearing where Paul says, have among, have uh, the same, be of the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, he says to this uh, church in Philippi. So we'll be talking a little bit about what Paul means when he writes that. Well, I invite you to take a moment uh, to center yourself, to prepare for worship, to prepare to hear God's word for you this morning. Uh, and I invite you to do that as we listen to our prelude. <laughs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us pray. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, 
we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering hymn is God is Here. We will sing verses 1 and 4. Let us pray. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Just a little bit. Uh, our first reading comes from uh, Exodus chapter 17. So last week we heard of uh, Israel in the wilderness uh, not having enough food and God providing with manna and with quail. Today the problem is water. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile. And go, I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our psalm comes from Psalm 78, and uh, this is our melody. Joy. 
join me on the bolded verses. Hear my teaching, O oh my people. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will declare the mysteries of ancient times. That which we have heard and known, and what our forebears have told us, we will not hide from their children. We will recount generations to come the praiseworthy deeds in the power of the Lord and the wonderful works God has made. God worked marvels in the sight of their ancestors in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zon, splitting open the sea and letting them pass through making the waters stand up like walls, leading them with a cloud by day, and all the night with a glow of fire, splitting the rocks in the wilderness, and giving them drink as from the deep, bringing streams out of a rock, making them flow down like a river. And our second reading comes from Philippians chapter 2. Paul writes, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. And our Holy Gospel comes from the uh, Gospel of St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for they regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe in him. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Mm -hmm. 
Beloved people of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, this letter to the Philippians, is, I think, the warmest of the letters that Paul writes to the various churches. Paul is writing to a group of people, a group of, of believers, a church that he cares deeply about. And if you've ever gone through and if you've ever read the various letters that Paul writes, especially the letters that he writes uh, to churches rather than to individuals, uh, you may have noticed that very often Paul uh, gets uh, what we might call somewhat preachy with them, right? He's, he's correcting them. He's saying, don't do these things that you have done. How could you have, have thought of this? How could you, for example, in Galatians, how could you have so quickly turned to another gospel than the gospel in which you were, were taught? But in Philippians, if you read the, the, the uh, letter to the Philippians, Paul's tone is much different than it is in some of those other letters. Paul's letter, uh, or uh, Paul's tone here in Philippians is a tone of gratitude. It's a tone of, of deep caring, of intimate friendship. Clearly, this is a group of people that he cares deeply about. This church in Philippi is a church that Paul himself founded. He was there right at the beginning of this church in Philippi. You can't say that about all of the other churches to which Paul writes his letters. So, for example, in Romans, which we've had the last several weeks, Paul is writing to a church he's never been to, a city of Rome where he's never made it. And he might know one or two people in particular, uh, but he doesn't know them as a church body. He's sort of introducing himself. Not so in Philippians. He was there at the beginning. If you read in Acts chapter 16, you can read about the beginning of this church in Philippi, about how uh, when he and, and Silas uh, went there in order to, uh, to evangelize to people in the city, they found a place of prayer and they met a woman uh, named Lydia, a woman who was a, a wealthy woman, a, a seller of purple cloth, the text tells us, and who undoubtedly had a house that was large enough to be able to house that early church, to be able to serve as the meeting place, as the place of worship for those first Christian believers in Philippi. You'll also read about how Paul and Silas get thrown into prison because they are upsetting the order of things in Philippi. And while they are in prison singing and praising God, there is an earthquake which makes the chains fall off of their wrists, which makes the doors of the prison fly open. And when the Roman guard wakes up and, and sees that the uh, prison has been uh, uh, opened up like this and the doors are hanging open, he assumes, of course, that all of the prisoners have escaped. All of the people who are his charge escapes and out of shame or out of fear of what will be done for him, he goes to take his own life. But Paul cries out, wait, we are all still here in this prison. And if you remember that, that prison guard at that time and his whole family become believers. They all come to believe. They are all baptized and they become members of that church in Philippi. This is a place that Paul maybe didn't spend all that much time, but the time that he spent there was rich and deep, and the connections that he made there were deep and real. And so when he writes to this Philippian church, however many years later, this is a group of people that he deeply loves, that he has warm memories of, and that he uh, is very grateful for. Paul is writing this letter from prison again. So he was in prison in Philippi. He's in prison again. He doesn't say where he is in prison. Uh, some people guess he's in Rome, but we really don't know. But he's in prison again, and he's writing to this church in Philippi from prison. And, and so people have wondered, well, why is Paul writing this letter? You know, you wonder, people don't usually just write letters for no reason in the ancient world. I mean, paper or papyrus, I should say, is, is expensive. You know, you're, you, you, you don't have a lot of access to it. It takes a lot of work to send a letter to somebody. There's no postal service. You have to actually send a messenger and, and pay for them, or if it's somebody you know, at least provide provisions for them so they can make the journey to these places. Uh, you want to have a reason when you're writing a letter. Why is Paul writing this letter? Uh, well, we have lots of guesses, but the guess that I like the best is that this is basically a thank you note. That the church in Philippi has heard of Paul's uh, being in prison and they have sent a gift or perhaps a messenger, somebody uh, to help care for Paul while he's in prison, to make sure he has adequate food, to make sure that he has adequate water because prisons at the time were not required to provide even the basic necessities for their prisoners. And so Paul is writing what one of my seminary professors called a thank you note that gets a little bit out of hand. It gets a little bit out of hand, this uh, several page long thank you note that he writes to the Philippians. After all, if you're going to write a letter, you've got to make it count, right? 
The section of Philippians 2 then finds Paul talking to the Philippians and encouraging them to be reconciled, to have the spirit of unity among themselves, to, as he says, let the same mind be in them that was in Christ Jesus. And then he quotes this, uh, or, 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 or writes, we don't really know, but he says this, these next few verses, verses 6 through 11, you might notice, are written in sort of this poetic form, right? They're broken up into lines. There's a sort of poem, or maybe even a hymn, um, that he's writing to them. And we don't know if he is making this up himself. Maybe he's composed this. Maybe this is an original Paul composition. Or maybe he's quoting some hymn that he sang with them when he founded that church in Philippi. Maybe it's some other lyrics to a song that they would know, and he's writing it to them um, in order to make this point. I don't know where it comes from, but either way, it tells the story of Jesus through the lens of humility. It tells the story of Jesus through the lens of pouring himself out for another, pouring himself out for those whom he loves. Let the same mind be in you, he says, that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was equal to God, in the form of God, he was the one through whom all things were created, we read in John's gospel. Even though he was in that form, he had that status, he didn't regard it as something to be exploited. That is, he didn't regard it as something to be used for his own benefit. I mean, presumably Jesus could have just, you know, hung around in heaven forever, eternally happy and joyful, never suffering anything in his life. Presumably he could have chosen that, but he didn't. He didn't see that advantage that he had as something to be used for himself. But Paul writes, but emptied himself, but poured himself out taking the form of a slave. He became a slave to his love for humanity, a slave to us in a manner of speaking, pouring himself out for our regard, humbling himself even so far as to death, even death on a cross. Now, this is the most uh, dramatic descent that there has ever been. There is no more dramatic of a humbling, of a humiliation that has ever happened. Going from God himself, the status of God himself, to the death that is reserved in the Roman Empire for slaves and traitors against the empire being hung on a cross. The most ignominious, the most uh, un... Uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Dishonored uh, form of execution there is. There is no more, of a, more dramatic of a descent than this. And Paul writes to the Philippians, let this mind be among you. And that seems a little harsh. Uh, now, of course, uh, di ch Christians at different times in this time actually did have to face execution and persecution. That did happen from time to time. I don't know if this was happening in uh, Philippi at this time. But it seems like a little bit much, doesn't it? I mean, how could we possibly be humble in the same way that Jesus Christ is humble? Well, of course, the hymn doesn't end there. The hymn goes on or the poem goes on uh, because the point of this isn't that Jesus died for death's sake, but rather that he died for our sake so that in his pouring himself out for us, when he is exalted, we might also share in that exaltation, share in the salvation, the resurrection that Jesus himself received, that God also highly exalted him, gave him the name above every name, that is, God's own name was given to Jesus, so that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's hard to read that without saying amen at the end. And then Paul says this, and this is a, a, a line that maybe uh, is a little surprising to us. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, we hear that, we uh, Lutherans and, and many other, and Christians in general, I should probably say, we hear that and we start to worry a little bit. What does it mean to work out our own salvation? What does it mean to work it out with fear and trembling? Aren't we saved by grace after all? Aren't we saved by the free gift and promise of God? What does it mean to work it out? And why with fear and trembling? Aren't we supposed to be faithful and joyful? Isn't that what it means to be Christian? Well, Paul isn't here saying, you know, do what needs to be done so that you can be saved. Rather, he's saying because of the salvation that that poem that he's just said has, has laid out, the salvation that has already been done for you, that has already been given to you, the salvation into which you have already been baptized, have already been caught up. Because of that, live that salvation out. Live your life as though this is true. Live your life as though Jesus Christ really is your Lord, because he is, because it really is true. And so live in that way. And how, what does it mean to live in that way? It means to have the same mind in you that was in Jesus Christ. Not elevating yourself above another, but pouring yourself out for another. 
pouring yourself out, not just to, you know, get some uh, recognition for how humble you are, but actually pouring yourself out for the other person, for the good of the other person. Now, we have to be a little bit careful with language like this in Scripture because there are, uh, and maybe you've known people uh, who have, 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 have done this or have been victims of this, this sort of language can be used uh, by those who are in positions of power to make sure those who are lower than them stay lower than them. They say, well, you're supposed to be humble, aren't you? Or maybe uh, you've known or, or maybe even have been in a, a relationship where there was an abusive dy dynamic, whether it was physically abusive or simply uh, abusive and exploitative in another way, where the one who was the abuser said something like this, maybe even quoted passages from scripture like this saying, well, you ought to be humble. Jesus Christ humbled himself unto death. Why can't you be humble in this relationship? Clearly, that is an abuse of this. Notice in the hymn, it's not the weak pouring themselves out for the strong. It's the strong Jesus Christ pouring himself out for us who are weak. And notice another thing. None of this is addressed to one single person. So in English, we use the word you for everything, whether we're talking to one person or a whole group of people, right? I say you. Uh, if I was from the South, I'd say y'all, right? So you'd know if I was talking to y'all or, or you in particular. Uh, but in, in, in other languages, though, there's different words for this. So Spanish, uh, if you know Spanish at all, you say tú uh, or usted if you're talking to one person, or you say ustedes if you're talking to multiple people. Uh, in Greek, it's the same. There's, there's different words for one or, or plural. And and all throughout this passage, Paul is using that y'all form. He's saying, you all. So let this mind be among you all, he says. This isn't just for one person in particular, as though this can be fulfilled by one person being humbled, but rather let the mind, this mindset be among you all. And of course, he's talking to the church. Let the church be a place in which this spirit of humility reigns. Let the church be a place in which people are laying themselves down for one another, pouring themselves out for one another, pouring out their strength for the sake of the other who is weak and receiving in return the poured out strength of that other. This is something which is addressed to a community and the spirit of humility, of humbleness, unites us as a community unites us so that we aren't, uh, don't become like so many human groupings become, including within churches, by the way, uh, a bunch of, of, of political sniping at each other. And I don't mean political in the big election sense, although I suppose it could take that form too, but the po politics within every organization of one person lifting themselves up over another or, or another person, you know, weaponizing their humility, showing how humble they are so that they get some regard uh, within the group from the others. The church is not to be a place of this but a place of actually pouring out yourself for the sake of another. And the church can only do this because God has poured himself out for you. That in your baptism, uh, in the receiving of communion, in the hearing of the promises of scripture, God himself is pouring himself out for you. Jesus Christ is giving all of himself to you. Jesus Christ is becoming a slave to his love for you driven only by the desire to do what you need, to do what is needed for your salvation, to provide for you the life and the resurrection which he has accomplished for you. This is the deep truth that underlines everything we do as a church or even as Christians in the world, that Jesus Christ has given himself for us and therefore we can give ourselves to another. In the name of the Father, and of the Holy Spirit, or the Father and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of the day is Change My Heart, O God. We'll do it one time through.
Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Notice how similar the middle section of that creed is to our, our reading from Philippians, the, the coming down and the going up there. We continue with the prayers of the church. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. God of grace, give your church unity. Give to all the baptized the mindset of Christ Jesus who poured himself out for us. Make your church humble and obedient, both in places where it has power and in places where it struggles. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the nations, turn our governments toward life. Where our ways are unfair, give us new hearts and new spirits. Where sin permeates our cultures and institutions, change our minds and teach us to trust your authority. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of healing, our lives are yours, O God. Relieve the suffering of those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit. Defend the lives and welfare of children who are abused or neglected hungry or exploited, bullied or lonely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of giving, turn this congregation away from our own interests toward the interests of others. Fill us with your compassion and sympathy. Bless the ministries of care in our community. Make us into signs of your mercy and justice for our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also lift before you these people and situations we name aloud, uh, either aloud or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Also with you. There you are. I feel like I had to wait extra long for that one. Being turned around, you know, we're out of practice. So, yeah. We continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full. Oh, oh, oh. 
Go ahead and open your bread. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and he broke it, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, the cu This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. I don't know that I have a lot of announcements uh, this morning. Nobody's left any notes on my podium, so I'm not going to read any uh, announcement notes. Um, but uh, again, the, uh, uh, the if you have desserts that you are purchasing or that you have purchased already, um, those will be uh, picked up as usual over by the Fellowship Hall entrance, but remain in your car and, and drive around. Uh, do please note that because we are turned around, uh, the as you came in the far side with a Okay, I got to make directions. The north side, uh, you'll be exiting the south side. So we're just uh, continuing uh, the opposite of how we have been um, up to this point. Um, so you'll be exiting out of the south end, and there will be uh, offering collected there. Um, for any other announcements, I uh, direct you to your um, offering sheet. Um, I think the only thing, other thing I would say is uh, we had uh, Sunday school again this morning. I forgot to count how many kids, but there are quite a few kids there, and that continues to go well. Um, if uh, you are, if you know of somebody or you're expecting to receive emails uh, for that and haven't been, please let us know, and we'll make sure we get uh, your email on the list. If if you have uh, kids or, or grandkids who um, uh, want to be a part of that and you haven't been hearing from us, uh, please contact us and let us know that. Um, I changed my page, but I should not have. Receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And our sending hymn is sent forth by God's blessing. We'll sing verse 1. Christ is with you. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.